it gives me a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Alan Fenwick. Thank you for coming today. Problem is I can't sing, and nor could I sing that. <laughs> so Simon Tamar, it's a great honor to be invited to give this lecture, one that I've attended over many years. And uh, I thought uh, that I would start by saying where we are today. Often in films, you get flashbacks. Because neglected tropical diseases, there has been a huge amount of progress in the last 102 years. And literally in the last year, 978.9 .9 million people were treated for one or other of the neglected tropical diseases free of charge with donated drugs. It's a success story and one that I hope that uh, you'll remember because we'll go back and go forward. Of those neglected tropical diseases, as you can see here, uh, lymphatic filariasis and onchocerciasis on the left um, because their programs have been going for longer and drug donations have been going longer, are a little bit ahead of the game. Schistosomiasis, sadly, and trachoma are a little bit behind so far in the number of uh, percentage of people who need treatment who are actually receiving treatment. Now, this data is from the World Health Organization, and it is in 2015. Things have gone forward uh, even in this one year, but the data is not yet available. A hundred years ago, we didn't even know that snails transmitted schistosomiasis. We had no drugs against schistosomiasis. Trachoma, LF, river blindness were hardly mentioned anywhere. However, there was a very successful deworming program, particularly against hookworm, in the United States. And that, as far as I've been able to find out, was about the only program against these neglected neglected tropical diseases. So how did we get to where we are today? I'm going to just take a little step back. This is the Manson lecture. I'm sure most of you have heard of Schistosoma Mansoni, so you know that he's a relatively famous person. But just what did he do way back a uh, hundred odd years and more ago? He graduated as an MD in 1867, which is mind-blowing, really. And then he worked in Formosa for the Chinese Imperial Maritime <laughs> Customs. And what he did do was keep a diary, and he kept coming across cases of elephantiasis, leprosy, and beriberi. As early as 1877, he hypothesized that mosquitoes were responsible for the transmission of lymphatic filariasis, and he was basically laughed out of town. He worked with Ronald Ross. Now, I think many of you who know about malaria know that Ronald Ross was responsible for elucidating the transmission of malaria with mosquitoes. In fact, Manson and Ross did it together, but Manson very, very kindly gave all the credit to Ross. But he did two things that would send ethical uh, committees into a blue funk today. From a consignment of infected mosquitoes he got sent to London, he infected his son and a laboratory technician <laughs> to show that mosquitoes <laughs> carried malaria. And then he sent two of his PhD students, or students, Lowe and Sambon, to live for three months in a highly malarious area of Italy. And he had them sleeping in a mosquito-free room while their neighbors were sick and dying of malaria thereby proving that if you can protect people in those days from mosquito bites, they wouldn't get malaria. He was a true tropical parasitologist and was responsible for the discovery of many other pathogenic parasites and particularly their life cycles with great imagination. In 1897, he wrote a letter to the Lancet. How many of us have done that? Stressing the need for tropical medicine teaching. And as a result of his recommendations, it actually led to the foundation of the London School of Tropical Medicine in 1899. And coming from Liverpool, I have to say, six months after the opening of the world's first tropical school in Liverpool. In the 20th century, Manson taught at the London School, and he was medical advisor to the Colonial Office. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1900, and he was knighted in 1903. 
And in 1907, he was one of the founders of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and its first president, and that's the group. So that answers your question, which was first, the Royal Society or the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine? It was the Royal Society. So what I'm going to do is just look at what I have been able to find as what happened in 20-year periods between then and now. The life cycle of hookworm was only elucidated in 1901. It was found to be a huge problem. And in Puerto Rico, they reckoned that 12,000 people a year were dying of hookworm. The southern United States was horrific. 40% of the population was infected with hookworm. And then the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission set about eradicating it. And it was probably the very first really successful program to eliminate uh, the, one of these neglected tropical diseases. And trachoma, trachoma was responsible for nine out of 10 immigrants who were diagnosed with it, for them being sent back when they were trying to go to America. There was somebody screening in Ellis Island people for trachoma. It's virtually disappeared in Europe even before antibiotics were discovered because of improved living standards. However, as you'll see later, trachoma is still endemic in 51 countries. Robert Leeper. I'm, I'm going to bring out a few names that some of you may know, some of you may not. But Robert Leeper was born in Scotland, and I have to say quite a few good parasitologists do come from Scotland. And he qualified uh, in Glasgow, and he was appointed by Manson to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He was fascinated by the natural history of parasites. And he went off to Shanghai, where he was sent to investigate the life cycle of Schistosoma japonicum along the Yangtze River. And he was the one who proved beyond all doubt that snails were, in fact, the intermediate hosts. And then they sent him to Egypt to do the same thing, where he linked again S. mansoni and S. hematobium to snails. Still on schistosomiasis, it may be the most neglected tropical disease of the neglected tropical diseases today, but it certainly wasn't in those days. And Christofferson, who's a, a very controversial figure, uh, discovered the first drug against schisto. And this was when he was working and had been working in uh, Khartoum and Omdurman. He was captured, actually, in the uh, First World War, but sent back to the UK, where there was a Bilharzia clinic, which he ran for the Ministry of Pensions. And it was in 1918 that the first drug, supposed, I say, effective drug, uh, unfortunately, it was a bit of a toss-up whether it killed the worms or whether it killed the people who were taking the antimony drug at the time. But for many, many years, uh, almost 50 years, the use of antimony derivatives were the only treatment for schisto. And then he, too, was president of the tropical disease section of the Royal Society of Medicine. Very little happened from 20 to 40, but again, schistosomiasis in Egypt and the Sudan uh, is the highlight of many of the papers that you'll read about uh, in the annals of uh, tropical medicine. Of course, there were a lot of papers on malaria, but... Uh, for time sake, I'm not going to really talk about malaria today and concentrate on the NTDs. But there were some wonderful papers written by individuals, particularly referring to papers in the Sudan by Greeny, where the actual prevalence and intensity and morbidity due to schistosomiasis was unbelievable. And then suddenly, from 1960 onwards, we started getting successful projects. And the first one was against onchocerciasis, which is river blindness, uh, where it was estimated that between 25 and 40% of all people over the age of 40 were blind. 25 to 40% of all people over the age of 40 were blind in these countries in West Africa. And uh, the powers that be uh, decided that something should be done they set up the onchocerciasis control program in these 11 countries. The only tool they had in their armory at the time 
was insecticides. And they had found that the simulium worm, uh, worm, flies were uh, breeding in fast flowing water. And so they were spraying DDT all over West Africa in every uh, fast moving river in order to control the simulian larvae. When you look back, you've got to feel really sorry for those people who settled on the banks of fresh water. They had uh, very fertile soil for their animals and uh, plenty of sunshine too. They seemed to be in heaven. And then the simulian flies came along and bit them and they all went blind. But then with the donation of Mectizan in 1987, control operations completely changed. The larvae siding was known not to be environmentally friendly, but with the ivermectin treatment, uh, because it was uh, found by Merck that mectizan or ivermectin would actually sterilize the adult worms, the onchocerciasis worms in the population. Now, the adult worms gave birth to live larvae, and these larvae wandered around the skin waiting to be bitten by a simulium fly, caused terrible itching, but also crossed the retina and caused blindness. So if we could sterilize the adult worms, there were no larvae. And if there's no larvae, there's no itching, immediate uh, improvement in health, and of course, uh, blindness would be, uh, would be stopped. By 2002, OCP was closed down because transmission and blindness were deemed to have been halted in those 11 countries. Back to Egypt and back to schistosomiasis. In 1963, the Nile Delta was treated with molluscicides because at that time it was thought that the snails were the weak link. Those of you who work on schistosomiasis in the field will now know that the last thing the snails are are weak links. They can survive all sorts of attack from um, environmental change and from chemicals. But what the Egyptians did then was they decided that they would use um, the antimony drugs, 14 injections peritoneally, and they used to line villages up in very heavily infected areas and treat them all with the same needle. Today, hepatitis C is 10 times more prevalent in Egypt than in any other country in the world. And the uh, schistosomiasis control people in the 1960s are held to be responsible. It was a busy two decades for schisto. A number of different drugs uh, were tested, hycanthone, ambulhar, metrifonate. Originally and initially, all of them looked really good, but slowly but surely, uh, drawbacks were found with each of them. And then in the 1970s, praziquantel was developed. At the same time, two molluscicides were developed, frescon and niclosamide, and they were both used both in Egypt and in the Sudan. Meanwhile, in Ethiopia, Aklilu Lemma came up with yet another uh, um, uh, snail molluscicide called uh, endod, a natural plant. And there were a, a vast number, it would seem to me, relatively speaking, of schistosomiasis experts in those days, more than there are today almost. Uh, Rick Davis, Bob Sturrock, Joe Cook, Peter Jordan, Jerry Webb, Ray Foster, and even me as a young lad, bottom right picture. The, the, top, three, the top three were the real dinosaurs of schistosomiasis control. Jerry Webb was the most incredible drummer Rick Davis was a concert pianist, and every, every time they came out to visit me in the Sudan and then later in Egypt, they would play music all through the night. It was a, it was a, it was a great time. The team on the right all worked on the St. Lucia project, but my two big favorites are bottom left, George Nelson and uh, Narcis Cabaderini, who was uh, very young uh, in those days, but uh, is a, a, a dinosaur of African schistosomiasis today. And then we come to 1980, and this gentleman has got to be the hero uh, beyond all heroes for neglected tropical diseases. Roy Vagilis was a, a, a scientist, and he, he went through Merck Sharp Dumb to become their CEO, and he was their CEO 
when they discovered that ivermectin would in fact um, combat uh, onchocerciasis and prevent the larvae being born. But because the governments and the patients who needed that drug were so poor, he influenced the board to donate as much mectizan as was needed because it had to be given annually to governments and patients in the onchocerciasis endemic areas at no cost for as long as would be needed to eliminate this river blindness. And since 1986 until the present day, that drug has reached over millions of people, probably near 100 million people every year. The public health campaign was hugely successful, and river blindness is no longer a public health issue in those previously endemic countries. But that wasn't enough. The onchocerciasis control program was then expanded into 19 new countries. And again, Mectizan was uh, delivered wherever there were um, foci of onchocerciasis. It was a partnership, the first public-private partnership probably in the medical field with ministries of health. The communities were very involved, international and local NGDOs, the private sector, Merck, Sharp and Dom, donor countries, because the drug had to be delivered, and the UN agencies, the World Bank as the fis fiscal agent, and the World Health Organization as the executive agency. Back to schistosomiasis. In St. Lucia, in Sudan and Egypt, which are not exactly, apart from Sudan, possibly the poorest countries in the world, there were control programs. In St. Lucia, it was a research control program, controlled by chemotherapy, water supplies, and molluscicides in separate valleys. The Blue Nile Health Project in Sudan was the first um, multi-disease program aimed at controlling both malaria with indoor spraying <coughs> and drugs and schistosomiasis, where everybody living in the Gezira scheme was offered a lump of concrete as a pit latrine top so that the uh, sanitation would improve, and at the same time they were treated with praziquanto. And then in Egypt, uh, they went for elimination. The World Bank Control Project and the USAID-funded schistosomiasis research project worked together. But then there were downsides. A huge outbreak in Senegal, and then an upside again, because Shimpung, a South, uh, Ameri a South Korean company, entered the praziquantel market and dropped the price from a dollar a tablet to less than 10 cents a tablet, which made it suddenly uh, a little bit more affordable to the countries who needed it. As we get towards the year 2000, the International Trachoma Initiative was formed. Since the days of Ellis Island, we can find very little in the literature about trachoma, but the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation funded uh, Joe Cook, who is photographed there, to actually first of all work on schisto and then to work on eye diseases. And with Pfizer, who actually produced Zithromax, which is an antibiotic against trachoma, pe partnered to start the ITI. They had a, a, safe, a safe policy, surgery to, collect, to correct eyelids, antibiotic treatment with Zithromax, face washing, and environmental improvement to control flies. Then albendazole became much more uh, of, uh, in, into the fore. Now, albendazole was patented in 1975, and there's an interesting uh, little sentence in Wikipedia that says, albendazole as a deworming drug can actually be purchased outside of the United States for between one and five cents a tablet. Do you know how much it costs in the United States? $18. No wonder the insurance companies do quite well, hey. It's uh, produced by GSK and has been donated since 1998 for the control of lymphatic filariasis because when given in conjunction with Mectizan, the two miracle drugs I like to call them, 
Lymphatic filariasis worms will also be sterilized, and this will stop transmission. Now, the good thing about um, the worms which cause lymphatic filariasis is they're relatively short-lived, six to seven years. And so if we can widely distribute uh, mectizan and albendazole, we will stop the transmission of lymphatic filariasis. It's carried by mosquitoes. And it's possible in theory, so the mathematical modelers tell us, to eliminate lymphatic filariasis. This has been done in a few, a few sites, particularly uh, in Egypt and in um, Zanzibar. And in sub-Saharan Africa, programs are now going forward. Elsewhere in the world, they don't use ivermectin with albendazole, they use diethyl carbamazine. GSK have been very generous. They give 600 million tablets a year of albendazole to actually treat lymphatic filariasis. And recently, in the last five years, they've realized that albendazole is also a deworming tablet, and there are many, many children who don't live in LF areas. And so they've added on 400 million tablets for deworming of school-age children. Factories dedicated to the production of albendazole make now a, milli a, billi a billion tablets a year, which GSK donate. So who are, the, who are the champions in the 1990s of the neglected tropical diseases? The young man in the top left is uh, David Molyneux, and below him, Lorenzo Savioli, who worked for uh, the World Health Organization as their NTD coordinator. Eric Otterson in the middle championed the lymphatic filariasis control program in the 1990s. And then Adrian Hopkins, who, like me, is retiring this year, uh, he has been the champion of the Mectizan uh, project. And uh, Peter Hotez, who uh, I don't think has ever set foot in Africa, but boy, he writes an awful lot of papers. <laughs> so from the year 2000 to date, what happened in the year 2000 was actually the Millennium Development Goals. And in the Millennium Development Goals, the first two are uh, the reduction of poverty and hunger, and the improvement of education. And we were then, we neglected tropical disease champions, were able to turn around and say, how on earth are you going to reduce poverty and hunger when a vast number of people in this world, one in six of the population, are actually riddled with worms, which are eating the little bit of food that these people get. So we must deworm them. And how are you going to improve education if the kids are too tired and too sick to go to school? How are you going to improve maternal health if the women of childbearing age have all got worms and schistosomiasis and are suffering from anemia? Because anemia is the worst cause of a poor birth outcome. Who listened to us? Well, not DFID and USAID yet, but they did very shortly afterwards. But the people who listened were the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in 2002, they gave funding for ITI, the International Trachoma Initiative, for the establishment of SCI in Imperial College, and funding for the Global Alliance for the Elimination of Lymphatic Filariasis. So let's look at that. And remember, I haven't mentioned LF hardly in the 1920s all the way through. But suddenly, it was realized just what a problem LF was. It's another public-private partnership, formally established in the year 2000, and its sole purpose, I say sole purpose, but it's got four, fundraising, advocacy, communications, and technical assistance to the WHO, who were the recipients by that time of albendazole and mectizan donations. Again, it was a partnership, as I said. It included Merck and GSK, particularly the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and the Task Force for Global Health in Atlanta. And they really have done uh, a most fantastic job. Again, just to mention uh, Adrian, who has been the, uh, the CEO, if that's the right word, of the Mectizan Donation Program, handling all the drugs donated by Merck, all the Mectizan, uh, for the last several years. SCI 
uh, I was able to establish at uh, Imperial College, thanks to that, uh, what then was a huge donation from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which allowed us to work in, uh, in six countries. And we had some, uh, some real stars on our, uh, on our board, uh, advisory board, uh, and then down on the left, two of the new young stars who will be taking over SCI uh, with Wendy Harrison next year. So I've been talking all the time about neglected tropical diseases, but actually we only coined the phrase in 2005. Uh, the WHO and the Gates Foundation called this meeting to decide what to call, what to call these diseases which the Gates Foundation were uh, funding altogether. And we had representatives from African countries, WHO, Gates, GELF, SCI, World Bank, and various European countries to make the decision. Neglected people, oh, we can't have that, we don't neglect people. Neglected tropical diseases won the day. And now, the neglected tropical diseases need somehow to drop the word neglected, because as you saw from the very first slide, they're not nearly as neglected as they used to be. But we needed more money than the Bill and Melinda Gates could give us. And so uh, the group of people that you saw there all went and uh, badgered the US government. Uh, and it wasn't until 2006 that they first gave money. It sounded like a lot of money, $100 million. But it was over five years and had to be spread over 10 countries. So uh, it ran a bit uh, thinly. But in 2010, they increased it with another donation for neglected tropical diseases thanks to the success of the first grant, and uh, uh, another sum has been added. And the main implementing agency throughout has been RTI, Research Triangle, and uh, Envision is the name of the uh, Neglected Tropical Disease Implementation Program, which is currently being run. The British government, who, as we all know, have got a lot of money to spend on neglected tropical diseases, Fortunately, and we were very fortunate to have champions within DFID, and uh, a 50 million uh, pound sum was put aside for five years in 2008, which, which was at the time uh, miraculous. And then uh, in 2012, uh, a new 200 million pound four-year commitment was made, and that will probably stretch a little more, uh, I think, through to 2018. What happens then? Well, we're going to need some very strong advocacy and some very positive results if we're going to uh, be successful. There are very few other donors. No other bilateral donors. The World Bank uh, is a donor. The Children's Investment Fund Foundation has uh, recently increased and increased their donation, particularly for deworming children in Kenya, Nigeria, and India. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation I've already mentioned, the Global Network uh, for Neglected Tropical Diseases, which was started 10 years ago, but actually has now closed down. But also the public. The public have been sold on the idea that deworming and schistosomiasis control is important. And uh, thousands of people now donate to diseases that they can't spell, can't pronounce, and have never seen, which is quite an achievement. The new wave is, uh, uh, is growing. The end fund, uh, which was started by um, a philanthropic uh, for-profit company called Geneva Global and funded by um, uh, the Legatum, who are philanthropists. And over, their, over the last two and a half years, they've expanded uh, to uh, giving away something like $30 million in donations. And their target is to get to $100 million which they spread out to the countries which are not being covered by other programs. They've got 10 implementing partners and they're currently working in 15 countries. But independent charity evaluators, which I wouldn't be surprised if very few of you have heard of, uh, Giving What We Can, which is based in Oxford, uh, Give Well, which is based in the Silicon Valley in the States, and The Life You Can Save, uh, which is a, an international organization, all evaluate charities. And of the top seven that GiveWell have recommended this year, 
Two are malaria charities based in the UK, and four are deworming charities. Uh, modestly, I'm happy to say that SCI is one of them. And they have actually led to us receiving millions of dollars, which we can add to the grants that we've got from USAID, from DFID, and from the End Fund to actually uh, expand our um, expand our program into new countries, but also uh, support the countries which we've started in, but haven't got enough money to reach national uh, coverage. So a little bit about SCI. Um, it's only had a short life, 16, uh, 14 years. Uh, we got that grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and then got some more money from them in 2005. Uh, Legatum allowed us to expand from our original six countries to Rwanda and Burundi in 2006. 2009 or 10, we got funding from DFID, for which we are, uh, were very grateful at the time and are even more grateful for their continuing support. And then the give well and giving what we can recommendation came through. And recently we've had grants from the End Fund and UBS. So we are now in 16 countries. We started in the six, added in Rwanda and Burundi. With the uh, DFID money, we were able to add in Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Malawi, and Mozambique. And today, uh, we've expanded even more. But there are still gaps. And the amount of money that we've got from all these sources is probably about 40% of all the money that we need if we're going to actually expand and uh, eliminate uh, schistosomiasis. Uh, the WHO have, uh, as you know, uh, always come out with ambitious plans. And their first ambition, ambitious plan was to eliminate schisto in some countries by 2020. Uh, and uh, go even further by 2030. I'm not quite sure we'll make it by 2030, uh, but there are very positive signs that the number of people dying from advanced schistosomiasis uh, will be very, very few uh, by 2020. If you want to pack a room, apart from having me speak, get Bill Gates to come and be uh, the convener of that, uh, of that meeting. And the famous London Declaration meeting was held at the end of January 2012, which amazingly is almost five years away now. And the fifth year anniversary is going to be celebrated in Geneva uh, in, uh, in April. But there was an unprecedented attendance uh, this, is, uh, this panel is only one of several panels that were convened with Bill Gates sitting in the middle. The uh, DG of the World Health Organization was there, uh, the minister from DFID, the CEOs of all the big pharmaceutical companies, and ministries of health from uh, a number of both donor countries and recipient countries were there. And they led to an unprecedented commitment, and in the very least, to um, an expansion uh, of the commitment over a period of time. And then uh, a, a year or two later, there was a meeting in Paris where SIF and uh, the Bill Gates Foundation committed to the control of soil transmitted helmets. Some very, uh, very important people in that photo too. But we all know what terrible things the pharmaceutical companies are and do, what profit makers they are and how unscrupulous they all are. But to the neglected tropical disease community, we couldn't do anything without them. Merck Sharpdom have, after that Bill Gates meeting, reconfirmed their commitment to donate Mectizan for as long as is needed to control both river blindness and filariasis in Africa. And although there's no blindness due to Onco in Africa, we still have to make sure that we treat because there are plenty of simulium there. GlaxoSmithKline I've already mentioned, and they donate a billion tablets of albendazole every year for both um, lymphatic filariasis and for deworming school-aged children. Johnson & Johnson, uh, the last speaker this morning, mentioned both albendazole and mubendazole. Johnson & Johnson donate mubendazole for uh, deworming children. And they up their ante to from 50 million tablets a year, which they were donating prior to the London Declaration, and now they donate 200 million tablets a year, which means 
that outside of the treatment of lymphatic filariasis, we have in our hands 600 million deworming tablets every year, which can be given either once a year or twice a year in endemic countries to try and reduce the burden. Pfizer uh, originally committed to provide 120 million doses of zithromycin for trachoma. They've increased it year by year. And in 2016, they will donate 120 million doses of um, Zithromax to control trachoma. Novartis, I'm not going to go into this in great detail uh, because of time, but they uh, have a commitment to multi-drug therapy for leprosy. ASI are one of the uh, newer donors and come from uh, Japan, where they are providing billions of tablets of DEC which is used with albendazole outside of Africa. And Merck, and this is the German company Merck, uh, they originally came in rather late in 2008 and said that they would commit to 20 million praziquantel tablets a year, which sounds fantastic, until you realize uh, that it's only enough to treat 8 million children and there are 200 million people who need treating in sub-Saharan Africa. But, again, Thanks to uh, 2012, the WHO and, and uh, the Gates Foundation, they increased uh, annually their donation. And this year, uh, actually next year, they will produce 250 million tablets of praziquantel every year uh, for at least the next five years, which is enough to treat 100 million children every year for schistosomiasis, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So as you can see, the pharmaceutical industry play a huge part in the uh, increase in the uh, health of the uh, people who are in the poorest areas and suffering from neglected parasitic diseases. This is a, a, a summary slide which I've uh, berated GSK about because unless you sat in the front row, you can't read it. But basically what they're saying is that they have donated five billion tablets of albendazole already, and they're aiming uh, to reach 61 countries uh, for lymphatic filariasis and 55 countries uh, for um, deworming pills. So if we're doing all that treatment, can we actually stop treatment? Can we break transmission, or have we broken transmission? Well, the answer is, basically, we think we are getting there. And in the Gambia and Malawi, uh, lymphatic filariasis is no longer being treated. And onchocerciasis in Niger, Senegal, and Malawi is the data I have. And there are a few other countries which have been uh, treating religiously for uh, LF and onco, which are going to stop in the next few years. As you can see, the countries at the bottom are those countries which perhaps uh, one or two of them could be there, but they are perhaps those countries which uh, have had periods of instability. If we have instability, if we have poor governance, we are not going to be able to treat the whole population with pills, even though it's only once a year. Trachoma and ITI, this is uh, the ITI slide, which says that uh, while there are 232 million people estimated to be living in trachoma endemic areas, they are delivering an awful lot of drugs. And their cumulative figures so far, although um, they uh, said that they would originally uh, give 120 million tablets, they've already delivered over 625 million tablets of uh, Zithromax. And in uh, 2016 alone, 120 million are going to be distributed. I have to say that the reason that they're able to distribute it is because trachoma has now been mapped. And it's been mapped as a result of a donation from DFID. And uh, Simon Bush is here from Sightsavers. Uh, and they have been responsible with other NGDOs for mapping uh, trachoma throughout the world so that we know where that zithromatic, uh, zithromax can go. So go back to the global status. And uh, again, just to remind you that uh, there's still a long way to go with trachoma and still a long way to go with schisto. But the next point to come up against is all these donated drugs, how are they going to be handled? 
and the World Health Organization in the last year have put together a joint drug request review and support reporting mechanism so that countries only have to fill in one form for all the drugs they need. Of course, in order to do that, they need to know uh, through mapping just how and where the various neglected tropical diseases are. But basically, uh, it looks like an awful good idea and it works reasonably well. The drugs are requested, the countries need help with their mapping and they get that from uh, the WHO and from the various implementing organizations work, work with them. But the net result is that particularly for school age children, those drugs are available and every year they are delivered to the countries. It's then up to the NGOs, the ministries of health and the ministries of education to make sure that once the drugs are in the store, they don't die there, but they get delivered. So here we are. This is where we are, and this is where we can get to if we can get those drugs delivered. And the 2020 goals, the winning line, is a little, far, a little further away than it ought to be. But if we can get those drugs out and the increased drugs out, we will slowly but surely get there. But there is one component missing, and that's improved socioeconomic status, water supplies, and sanitation. And that's where we really are beginning to go forward now. We've got the drugs, we've got the mechanisms to deliver the drugs. We can treat the people who are currently infected, but can we stop new infections? And we're going to need water and sanitation to do that. And the World Health Organization have helped because all the countries have signed up to World Health uh, Assembly Resolution of 2013, which would lead to the elimination of these neglected tropical diseases. So have we actually got close to elimination and eradication yet? Guinea worm, we're getting there. Millions and millions of people used to have guinea worm, which is a horrific disease. Guinea worm cannot be treated because it's a worm which is a meter in length and lives in the human body, but if we can catch it when it's laying its eggs out into the fresh water and pull the worm out, and if we can treat the water and kill the intermediate host, uh, which are water fleas, then we ought to be able to eradicate guinea worm. Because up until very recently, we were all convinced that guinea worm was solely a human disease. It worked. It worked better and better and better until last year, there were only about 22 cases of guinea worm in the whole world until someone went to Chad to try and prove that we had eliminated guinea worm from Chad and they found 858 dogs were infected. So guinea worm has jumped from humans to dogs. Whether the dogs had it before and we didn't know about it, I don't know. But it's a very sad thing for Jimmy Carter because he's in his 90s now and he was determined to eradicate guinea worm before he was eradicated. And it's going to be a very close run thing, but my <laughs> prayers are out for him. And we're going to try and get rid of those last 22 uh, while, he, uh, while he's still um, around. But he, I mean, he's a remarkable man. He gave a, a, a talk to the, um, to the NNN, where, where was it? In the NNN meeting in, um, in Atlanta recently. Uh, sorry, no, the uh, um, ASTMH meeting. Onchocerciasis, river blindness, yes, it's still being transmitted in Africa, but in Latin America, it's virtually gone. WHO has verified that it's been eliminated from Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, and just a month or so ago from Guatemala. There are a couple of ongoing foci, but very, very small foci uh, in Brazil and Venezuela. So, I haven't mentioned it before, trypnosomiasis, sleeping sickness, is very, very close to elimination. The control of the, of the tsetse fly and uh, treatment is leading to the number of cases going down and down, so that less than 5,000 cases uh, this year, which is an incredibly low figure, 
because we don't have mass drug administration for trypanosomiasis. Leishmaniasis, again, uh, was down, then it went up, and now it's going down again. Leprosy. Every country in the world is now below the World Health Organization recognized target of one in 10,000 uh, prevalence of leprosy. I scratch my head at that because one in 10,000 people in Pakistan would be an awful lot of people still with leprosy. But of course, the wonderful thing for us is that only one in 20 people in the world are actually susceptible to leprosy. So the mathematical modelers have worked out that this should be enough for leprosy slowly but surely to disappear. The only problem is it's got so low that doctors no longer know how to diagnose it. So now the Millennium Development Goals are finished and we're into the Sustainable Development Goals. And an awful lot of work has been put in by an awful lot of people to try and get neglected tropical diseases involved. And yes, Goal 3 and yes, Goal 6 uh, does, uh, does at least refer to neglected tropical diseases. These are the summary of the indicators and traces of equality. So we've got 3.3 in the SDG target, where neglected tropical diseases are actually mentioned by name. And universal health coverage, of course, is what will eventually get rid of, uh, of our NTDs. And again, clean water and sanitation. Uh, there is a huge push now to make sure uh, that more and more people get uh, clean water and sanitation. Just to quickly say, there's no such thing, as uh, the, there's nothing worse than a bad latrine. So we've got to make sure that if we are going to give, uh, get sanitation uh, in, in rural areas, they've got to be sanitation that fit the needs of the, uh, of the population. And now disease management. So all of these neglected tropical diseases that have physical disabilities have got to be managed. They've never been managed before. Borrelia ulcer, leprosy, trypanosomiasis, leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, yours, all of them require individual diagnosis and treatment. And that is going forward thanks to support from the World Health Organization. So I've shown you a lot of old people who were the leaders in the 1990s. Today, the World Health Organization, uh, the neglected tropical disease team is quite big over 40 people, and Dirk Engels is in charge. And uh, the two ladies at the bottom are now the heads of SCI and RTI, so they're responsible for all of the uh, delivery of uh, the USAID funding and quite a lot of the DFID funding, uh, which those two organizations are, are responsible for. SCI is currently treating 32 million people this year uh, and uh, hopes to go up to 50 million a year uh, from next year, and RTI is reaching out to many more because uh, they also do other diseases other than schisto and STH. And in sight savers, um, who are also growing uh, from just their eyesight work into neglected tropical diseases, particularly in Nigeria, but in many countries where they've got offices. Uh, Simon Bush under his CEO, uh, Caroline Harper, uh, are really leading the way. And I, I, I couldn't stop without paying tribute to one of our best researchers in SCI, Joanne Webster, who is also looking at uh, new things in Schisto, including hybrids, which could well be uh, in a, a bit of a nuisance. Before I finish, I'd just like to acknowledge not all those slides are mine, and I've had a lot of help from David Molyneux and Russell Stoddart, Dirk Engels and Amadou Gaba with slides from the WHO. I would like to say that I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for all the staff of SCI, past and present, including the, the advisory board, and all the donors to SCI who have enabled us to go from nothing, and I mean nothing, in 2002, there wasn't a single program against SCI, against Schisto or STHs in sub-Saharan Africa. Today there's a program in almost every country, and uh, millions and millions, of you, as you've seen, of people are being treated for NTDs. So, Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you.